worship by opening up the Word of God. And uh, again, as was mentioned by our brother Danny earlier, if this is your first time here, we want to give you a very warm welcome to Imago Church. Uh, yeah, please feel free to let the uh, offering plate pass you by as it came by. Just be our guest today. We want to host you and welcome you. And uh, please make sure to fill out a Connect card um, right outside in the little welcome table right there. We'd love to pray with you and uh, hear how we can be of service to you as well. And in case we haven't met yet, my name's uh, Carlos Coro. I'm the pastor here of Imago Church, and I'm so grateful that together, as has been prayed by others, by Sister Mandy, that together we get to find our identity in the image of God and our purpose in the image of Christ. That's what Imago means, that we're created in the image of God. Just a, a couple of other brief uh, announcements before jumping in to the Word of God today. We um, will be taking Easter week off for men's and women's Bible studies. So on that week, there will not be men's and women's Bible study. Um, there will actually be a Good Friday service here on April 15th. And so we want to encourage everyone to take part in that um, on April 15th. And um, also, we have an Easter potluck sign-up sheet going around. And uh, yeah, just go ahead and sign up for that and bring something that you're going to be able to share on Easter, April 17th. And that's also going to be an opportunity to invite friends, family, and others and neighbors to that special time on Easter here at a later start time at 11 a.m. Uh, before service, I'll be around in case anyone wants to pray. We can have a little uh, Q&A, uh, Bible study time together. That'll be available beforehand for anyone that comes early. Because although the service will be at, at 11 a.m., I'm sure someone is going to show up at 9.30. And we'll be here for you. We'll be ready. But um, anyway, it, uh, we'll continue in our time of worship by opening up the Word of God, which will be in Matthew 26, verses 69 to 75. And you can follow along with your Bibles or you can hear God's Word read aloud. La escritura de hoy es del libro de Mateo, capítulo 26, versículos 69 a 75. So let's go ahead and hear now with open ears and open hearts from the Word of God. Matthew 26, beginning at verse 69. It should be on the slides, or you can follow along in your Bibles as well. Matthew 26, verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. That means he swore. He says, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are, the, you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words of Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning, which is representative, Lord, of your faithfulness toward us. We thank you for your church, your living spiritual body with us here and now. And Lord God, as we enter into this time, would you speak to us in a way that is fresh and clear and new this morning, God? Lord, you are a God who delights in meeting us where we're at. And you are a God who loves us too much to just leave us there. You take us to that next level, that next stage, God. Do that today, Lord. Make us new. Help us to shine, Lord, bright and reflect who you've created us to be. All glory, all power is yours, God. And Lord, a lot of us are coming with different baggage today. And right now we're laying it down before the cross, Lord. By your spirit, speak to us, Lord. Make our hearts and our minds new and open to you. 
It's in your name, Lord, the name of Jesus, the name above all names that we pray. Amen. Amen. So we've been in this series for the past five weeks now that has been our Lent series as we've been preparing for Easter. And we've called this series The Last Night. And we're actually concluding this series of teaching today because Palm Sunday is next week. And Palm Sunday is the beginning of Easter week, of Holy Week together. And we're going to have Palm Sunday Um, on next week, April 10th, then Good Friday on April 15th, and then Easter Sunday on April 17th here at Imago. So mark your calendars, uh, invite family, friends, neighbors, let's all rejoice together in that week. But on this series on the last night, we've been reflecting on the last moments of Jesus before he took the cross. We've asked ourselves, if I only knew I had 24 hours to live, What would I do? How would I spend that time? And in Matthew 26, we actually get a glimpse, we get an idea of what Jesus did with those last precious moments before his death. We see that Jesus, on the last night, um, he did several things. We've imagined ourselves in his shoes and have navigated that last night, those final moments, with him. We have uh, come to understand that Easter morning is the most important day in the history of salvation, in the history of humanity. And also, we've come to understand that this last night before taking the cross, the night of the cross, is also the most important night in the history of salvation and in the history of humanity. And we've been learning about how Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, how he spent his last night before his death. And we see several things that Jesus did, and they were completely unexpected. He could have done anything. He could have had a bucket list and gone all over the world and indulged in all kinds of appetites. But no, he didn't do that. What we see instead is that Jesus showed up to ordinary moments, and he made those moments holy moments and eternal moments. We see that Jesus, on his last night, he chose to pray in Gethsemane and spend some time in solitude with God the Father. We've seen that on the last night before taking the cross, Jesus was arrested. That means that Jesus had to wait, to be patient, to wait on the Lord during those final moments. Last week we saw how Jesus was on trial before the Sanhedrin and this was a process, a procedure, just hours before taking the cross. Jesus was under tremendous pressure from all around. But thank God our Lord Jesus, he didn't give in, he didn't give up. But our Lord Jesus stood firm and he trusted God with the outcomes. As we remembered last week, When we're in times of trial, we can look to Jesus because Jesus, in his trial, he was strengthened and he was guided by God's integrity. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about what that means, what it means to abide in God's integrity today. As we talked about last week, the definition of integrity is when we align our will, our heart, and our mind with the will, heart, and mind of God. Integrity is doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done. And today, as we conclude this series, we see the last event in this chapter, in the last night of the life of Jesus before taking the cross, is an event that many of us have read about or heard about, but sometimes don't know what to do with it. And it's this moment where Peter denies knowing Jesus. He denies being with Jesus. Now, this really means a lot for several reasons. One of them is because Peter was in Jesus' inner circle. Yes, we all know that Jesus had many followers, but then from those followers, he had 12 apostles. And then from those 12 apostles, he had his closest friends, the inner circle. They were three of them. They were Peter, James, and John. Those were the closest of the closest to Jesus. And then one of those three, Peter, on his last night before his death, Peter denied Jesus and actually even lied about not knowing him. 
he lied about even his relationship with Jesus. So many of us have heard of this story before, we've read it, and maybe a very obvious question that we need to ask ourselves is, why? Why did Peter lie? Well, in order to answer that question, the Bible's always going to do this to us. It's always going to hold up a mirror to us. In order to answer the question, why did Peter lie, we need to ask ourselves, why do we lie? Why do we lie to others? Why do we lie to ourselves? Why do we lie to God? You know, I once heard someone from a very rough background once give the best explanation on why we lie. And he said this, he says, we lie for self-preservation. We lie to try to save ourselves. In some ways, we lie to be our own saviors. We lie because there's this thought inside of us that says, God, you may not come through this time, so I'll take matters from here. I'll take it from here. We lie based on a fear that we will miss out on something. We lie based on a fear that something we have will be taken away from us. Or we lie based on a fear that we will not get something that we believe that we deserve. How about you? When you put yourself in Peter's place, when you put yourself in Peter's shoes, why do you lie? Or why do you sometimes refuse to take responsibility? You know, I've been in situations and I've had a lot of confession and repentance throughout my life where I've been in that same situation. But I've also been um, in situations where a disagreement or a challenge goes on and on and drags on and on because of denial because of denial, misdirection, and a refusal to take responsibility. You know, I, I, love, um, a, a num- uh, I love sports, and among sports, one of my favorites is basketball. And uh, I'm really excited about Final Four and big final for March Madness uh, tomorrow. Um, I haven't watched them, I've recorded them, so no spoilers, okay? None during fellowship, I don't wanna hear anything Okay, no apps, none of that. But I love basketball. And yes, these days there's a lot of, of flopping in sports where people pretend something happened in order to get a foul or whatnot. But the old school way of committing a foul in basketball is actually by taking responsibility for it when you take a foul. You know, the referee blows the whistle and the person who committed the foul raises their hand and tells the referee, it was me, I'm responsible, don't blame my teammates, it was me. That's integrity. Aligning our hearts and our mind with the mind, heart, and will of God. Again, doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done. There's also an attitude of integrity. The attitude of integrity, and I've shared this with some of you, and I've learned all these things, friends and brothers and sisters, through the School of Hard Knocks, but the attitude of integrity is to refuse passivity, accept responsibility, and lead courageously. Again, doing what needs to be done when it needs to be be done. Integrity is doing the right thing when it benefits you, and even when it doesn't benefit you, even when it costs you. Now, we don't know what this would have cost Peter to just tell the truth about being a follower of Jesus. But even when it costs us, and especially when it costs us, that's really where the rubber hits the road. You know, we talk about integrity from a personal, relational, and moral perspective, but it's also a very practical thing. 
You know, Charlotte and I have a very good friend who's been a friend of ours for many years. Uh, her name's Jessica, she's an engineer, and she and I even went to college together and we would talk about her classes, uh, architecture and engineering and all of that. And she once explained to me that there's something called structural integrity in engineering and in architecture. Do any of you know what that is, structural integrity? Yeah, many, many of you already know what that is. It's, it's a phrase within engineering and architecture, but the definition is this. The definition of structural integrity is the ability of a structure to stand its intended load without failing due to fracture and fatigue. And we've seen what happens when a structure is fatigued or compromised. We discover that the damage is not isolated. The entire structure is affected. So for example, even in this room, right? If just one of these pillars breaks or is destroyed, what do you think is going to happen? The stress, the weight will shift to the other parts of the building. The structural integrity is impacted. With one damaged column, that will impact the entire building. It probably wouldn't even be safe for us to meet here and worship here anymore just because of one column. When one is damaged, the rest is impacted. Again, think about it in what you use every day with your car, right? Everything's working, but all it takes is one flat tire, and that car isn't moving. The entire structure has been impacted. That entire vehicle will stop moving properly. When one part of the structure fails, the weight or the load does not just go away but it is transferred to and potentially overloads supporting surrounding structures. The failure of one part impacts the other parts because the stress is transferred to the other parts of the building or the other parts of the structure. Again, if you don't believe me, Think about a chair. You're all sitting on a chair right now with four legs. Just remove one of those legs, then sit in it and see what happens. That's going to be, that's, that's an example of structural integrity. And the same is true for you and me. The same is true for Peter in his denial. A failure in integrity for one adds stress and pressure to the persons around us. This is not new. We know this to be true. And we've experienced it. You and I have experienced the stress and the pressure of others due to the lack of integrity or not taking responsibility. If we're really honest, we'll confess that we have caused stress and pressure on others due to lack of integrity or taking responsibility. We can all think of a moment where we were in the same position as Peter, where we have the opportunity to do what needs to be done or say what needs to be said, but we don't because of any reason, and we can justify ourselves every single time. We're afraid of losing something, or we're afraid of missing out, or we want to control the outcome. Again, why did Peter lie? The same reasons you and I lie. The same reasons we misdirect things sometimes. Peter lied to strangers around him to people that had no power or authority over him. And this is the craziest part, right? Peter lied so that strangers wouldn't think that he was a liar. Think about that for a moment. <laughs> Peter lied so that strangers around him wouldn't think he was a liar. And sin is absolutely humorous. It's, it's hilarious when you think about it because it makes no sense. Sometimes like Peter, you and I, we lie to convince others that we are not liars. <laughs> Just think about that. There was a book that impacted me uh, many years ago on debt, on how to overcome debt. And it was a book called Your Money Counts. And the author said this, he says, we need to stop lying to ourselves. We need to be honest with ourselves when it comes to money. 
Because here's the truth, when we give in to the culture around us, to the influences around us, we buy stuff with money that we don't have in order to impress people that we don't know. That's how we get into debt. That's the circle, the vicious cycle of debt. We buy stuff with money that we don't have in order to impress people that we don't know. Isn't that insane? That's the insanity of sin. We can stand back and laugh at Peter and like, I can't believe he would do that. He didn't even know those people. The story of Peter is our story. It actually makes no sense. You know, we are more rationalizing than we are rational creatures, which is an amazing truth. Reason really is a slave to passion. If I am passionate about something, then guess what? I'm going to find a good reason or a good excuse for it. And it's going to make perfect sense. There's going to be a perfect explanation. But remember, Jesus offers us a new way. In Matthew 6.33, it says this. We can put it up on the slide. Matthew 6.33, and by the way, I want you to know this. As your pastor, this is my life verse. I pray this verse every single morning that I would abide in it and that Christ would guide in this. But Matthew 6.33 says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you as well. On our own, we can't achieve integrity. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of this, including integrity, will be added to you as well. Seek first Christ and the kingdom of God and you will see everything else fall into its proper place. But what do we do? Instead, we seek our own plans. We seek our own instincts. We seek our own ways and we see the stress and the pressure of the responsibilities that we're called to take on impact others. And that happens in so many ways, even with us here as a church body. And just to briefly say this, I want you to know this for those online, those here in person, everyone here, your presence, your roles, and your responsibilities really matter. You are blessed to be a blessing. And also, when we lack in that, when we lack to understand that we're blessed to be a blessing, when we lack in our presence, in our inconsistency, and in our responsibility, that impacts others. That impacts others in the church community structure as a whole. So my encouragement to each one of us is this. Live as if what you do matters, because it really does. Live as if your choices matter, because they really do. And they really impact others as well, even here in the family of God. And I get it. We're all super busy. We're all super important and overscheduled. I get it. Trust me, I do. I'm on the same boat as you. But I've come to learn this. Part of maturity is knowing that life is busy. And the years go by the reality is, and ask some of the people that have lived life here, ask, brother, ask Elder John, ask a few others, ask Nancy, as life continues, life gets more complicated, not less. Life is busy. Though, but those challenges are actually opportunities to practice integrity. That's why Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Living a life of integrity is that difficult and it is that simple at the same time. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Because here's the truth about explanations and excuses. There is always a rational explanation and an excuse not to do something. Especially when it comes to serving the Lord or the God's people. There's always a rational excuse and explanation not to do something. But guess what? That's the way of the world. That's the way of the culture around us. But what does Jesus say to that? He says, not so with you. Because my kingdom is not of this world. 
And there are several ways that we can make deposits into our integrity account. And I can say a lot more about this, but I'll just name them today briefly. We can make deposits into our integrity account through communication, consistency, and showing up, punctuality. And the reward of that is being dependable and maintaining the strength of the whole. Your contribution impacts the whole. And the lack thereof also impacts the whole. Every day, we tell ourselves lies and we make up excuses and justifications. And that's the truth. No one can do everything. But God calls us to consider what are my loaves and my fishes that I can give to the Lord and see him multiply that. You don't have to feed the 5,000, but Jesus is calling you, what are, what, what are your loaves and fishes? And just give those to him and just show up with that. You know, I've learned from this uh, podcast um, by one of my favorite leadership consultants. His name is uh, Kerry Newoff. And he says this, and you never think so. It's the complete opposite, right? He says, the number one way to build up self-esteem is by being honest with yourself. The number one way to build up self-esteem is by being honest with myself and keeping promises for myself. Integrity and self-esteem will not begin by looking good in front of others. Peter tried that, and how did that go for him? It didn't work. The journey of abiding in, in Christ, of abiding in integrity, begins with me. You can tell yourself that. Let it begin with me, Lord. You can pray, God, do what needs to be done when it needs to be done in and through my life today, Jesus. Here I am. Do the rest. The story of Peter denying Jesus is actually the story of you and me. It's the story that we're, we find ourselves too often wrapped in. It's the place where we are called by God to do one thing, but we flake, and we do the complete opposite thing, and we deny it, and we pretend by lying to ourselves, by lying to God, by lying to others, we pretend that God has not called us to something greater. But that's the reason we are so impacted by hearing this simple story that many of us have heard many times before and don't know what to do with, with it. We're impacted by hearing the story of Peter denying Jesus because it's a little too close to home. It's a little too real, a little too raw because we deal with it sometimes. This story reminds us of those moments, of those seasons, of those opportunities where our Lord Jesus Christ offers us so much more, but we settle for less. We find an excuse. We find a good explanation. We deny it and we justify ourselves. But remember, not too long before this moment happened, Jesus says to this same Peter, he says what? On this rock, I will build my church. In Matthew 16, 18, he says this, and I tell you that you are Peter. He reminds him of his identity, of his calling, of his purpose. And on this rock, I will build my church. And even the gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not overcome it. Peter was confident and on the mountaintop in that moment. But then what happens? Again, what happens to you and me? Peter begins to doubt in the promises of Christ. Peter begins to doubt in the goodness of God in his life. Remember, lying to ourselves or denials like Peter's, they all begin with the same question that we ask ourselves, and it's that same question that Adam and Eve had to answer in the garden. Can God really be trusted? Will God pull through this time? Friends, brothers, sisters, we do the same thing. 
the habit we have formed of doing like Peter, sitting at Jesus' feet for one moment, but then wanting to do nothing, but then wanting nothing to do with following him and denying him and functionally living as if he doesn't exist. When Jesus asks us to boldly move to the next level on this journey with him, what have we done? This all sounds so familiar. This is Peter. And the truth is, we are Peter. You might find yourself today in a situation like Peter in this passage. Where on the one hand, you want to follow Jesus with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And on the other hand, you want to deny Jesus, forget everything, and run. I've been there. We've all been there. This is our story. Jesus Jesus always makes a way back. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a while and you're worn down. You're tired. You're exhausted. You're ready to throw in the towel. And especially, you're very exhausted by this pattern going back and forth all the time. Friends, brothers, sisters, if that's you, I want you to hear this. There is grace for you. There is mercy for you. There is forgiveness for you. Jesus kept his promise with Peter. He'll keep his promise with you. Jesus continued to be faithful even when Peter denied him. And and Jesus fulfilled his promise on this rock, I will build my church on an imperfect person, on a flawed human being who's constantly going back and forth. Friends, there is grace, there is mercy for you just as there was for Peter. The cross has made a new way and the resurrection has provided a new beginning. Because here's the truth. When integrity guides us, we're not easily swayed or persuaded by what others may think of us or expect of us. We acknowledge the truth, just like Peter had to here. And acknowledging the truth about ourselves is that we do lie. We do lie to ourselves. We do lie to God, and we confess that. We confess and we repent that we have denied Jesus at times, and we fall and, and, and we fail to take responsibility for what we've been called to. Integrity And I want you to hear this. Integrity does not begin with perfection. But integrity does begin with honesty. Being honest with God, being honest with ourselves, and being honest with other people. Again, safe people, not just anyone, anytime, but God, myself, and those God has called me to do life with. In these few verses, Peter wasn't honest with God or with himself or with others. He became captive. He became imprisoned in that moment of his own denial. But we as God's people, we're not called to be captives. We're not called to be prisoners. We're called to be free. So may we let go of our denial. And together... With Christ at the center, may we be honest. Honest with God, honest with ourselves, and honest with one another. May we abide in Christ. And remember, we can't achieve integrity on our own. When we abide in Christ, we will abide in integrity. Aligning our hearts and our minds with the heart and mind of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, you are with us here and now. You are for us here and now. Thank you, Lord, that you don't edit this stuff out of your word, Lord God. 
of the person that you chose to be the first leader of your church, you don't edit out his shortcomings, his flaws, his fears, his denials, Lord. Thank you, God, because all of that reminds us that we need your grace. We need your love. We need you to make us whole. I want you to hear that today. If you find yourself like Peter this morning, or you've run away, or you've denied, Jesus is right in front of you. His arms are open to you. He'll receive you. He'll dust you up. He'll clean you up. And he'll send you on your way for his purposes and for his glory. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is for you. He will carry you. He will see you through this unique time and this unique season where maybe you feel like you need to take matters into your own hands. Maybe you feel like you need to be your own savior. But remember, God can be trusted. God will pull through. He will come through as he always has. The cross and the resurrection are his eternal reminders of his faithfulness. He will see us through. He is the only way to get back home. He is the only way to align ourselves and be right with God. Again, integrity won't be something we achieve by our own virtue, but by abiding in Christ, who is integrity in the flesh. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to rest in you today. Thank you for seeing us, for hearing us, for loving us, and for receiving us, just as we are. And thank you, Lord, for never, ever giving up on us. Lord, we're called to believe in you because you are Lord of Lords, King of Kings. But the most amazing part of belief, Lord, is that you do not give up on us and you believe in us. You believed in Peter, God, even when he denied you. And Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you bring all things together. So Spirit, come, do the work. We will yield, we will surrender, we will trust. Thank you, Lord. We pray all of this in the faithful name of Jesus. Amen.